One of the things I'd like to do this morning is just to take a few minutes and catch us up on kind of some of the inner workings of what's going on in the church, not just here at Shiloh, but the United Methodist Church and the church around the world. Some of you, for some of you, this will be really important information. For others of you, you may be wondering, why are you sharing this with me? And we'll, we'll get to that here in just a minute. So I've been kind of calling this my, my state of the church address that I want to just share with you just for a few minutes. Some of you may or may not know that Shiloh is a part of the United Methodist denomination. The United Methodist Church is a worldwide denomination with almost 12.5 million members. That's a lot. Imagine if they all showed up at church on the same day. Wouldn't that be awesome, right? 12.5 million members covering 136 countries around the world. The official voice of the United Methodist Church is twofold. It is the General Conference and the Book of Discipline. The General Conference meets once every four years. It's elected delegates from all over the world um, who come to worship. They come to celebrate what God is doing in and through the church. And they come to discuss matters that are important to the church. And then the Book of Discipline is kind of our guidelines for how to be United Methodist, what it means that we are United Methodist, some of the rules we choose to live by. Now, let me give you a little bit of history. In 1972, yes, that's the year I was born. Anybody want to boo me? Right? 1972, at the 1972 General Conference, there was um, a vote that narrowly passed to add some language to our Book of Discipline. That language to the Book of Discipline is regarding homosexuality. And so it became part of our Book of Discipline. And it says... The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, as this got added to our book of discipline, it had ramifications in other areas of ministry and mission and our lives together. It meant that uh, um, self-avowed practicing homosexuals would not be allowed to be ordained in the United Methodist Church. It meant that we can't conduct or perform um, gay marriages here at the church or uh, clergy can't participate in those. And that there were some restrictions on um, Methodist funding to LGBTQ causes. Now, Please understand me when I say that this, isn't, this issue is not just about homosexuality or human sexuality even. It goes deeper than that. It's about biblical interpretation, how we read the Bible. It's about creation and how God created God's people. It's about God's will and, and humanity, and it's about the unity of the church. Now, this issue, as you might imagine, has become a bit of an issue of contention, much like it is in our communities and in our world today. And so ever since that first general conference, this has been coming up and coming up and, and coming up, and sides have begun to form, right? There's a one side and the other side. And so on the right side, or the conservative or traditionalist side, there are groups like the Wesleyan Covenant Association, who have kind of created a pseudo-denomination preparing to draw. They've drawn some lines in the sands, and they have said that if the denomination doesn't land where we think it should land, we'll, we'll kind of take our toys and go home. There have been charges filed against those who have uh, acted in disobedience to the Book of Discipline, and there have been church trials, and it's been a difficult time for some folks. On the other side... On the left are groups like the Reconciling Ministries Network. And they have also kind of dug in and, and created some public disobedience to the Book of Discipline. Um, most, most predominantly the election of the first openly gay bishop of the United Methodist Church that has happened here recently. And so you imagine these two sides have kind of started digging their heels in and, and creating a, a lot of noise. One thing that I need you to hear me say that is absolutely critical, and if I don't, you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this, that I have come to the deep and abiding belief that there are faithful, God-fearing, Jesus-following, Bible-reading, deep-praying, well-meaning people on both sides 
of this argument. Then these people have read the same scriptures. They've wrestled with the same evidence. They've explored the same questions. And they've landed in different places on this topic. So at the 2016 General Conference, this conversation kind of came to a head. And it came close enough that we almost split the denomination in half. I'm thankful for a few folks who, in a moment of clarity, called the timeout. And they said, let's put a pause on all of this debate, put a pause on all of this, this conversation, and let's ask our bishops all over the world to help us develop a plan as we move forward. So the bishops formed what is known as the Commission on the Way Forward. These are 32 United Methodists from all over the world, from every political persuasion, from every theological uh, setting. These are from laity to clergy to, to bishops that came together. They met over the course of two years to discuss, to study, to pray over, and to bring a proposal back to the Council of Bishops for the church, for the United Methodist Church to move forward. We received that report back in April, and that, that report was given to the church, and they came up with three options. Those three options were, one, the traditionalist plan is what they called it, and it was really to affirm the current language in the Book of Discipline. It was uh, to strengthen the consequences for disobedience, and so that was, that was one plan, that one way to move forward. Another way to move forward was called the One Church Plan. And the one church plan was basically to remove that language from the book of discipline and let each church and annual conference decide how to proceed, kind of like we do with worship services and leadership structures, to decide how we want to be and who we want to be and how we understand God to be speaking. The third option was a connectional conference plan, is what they called it. And that was basically to create a number of conferences that you could join depending on your theological understanding on this issue. And they'd be kind of held together by a smaller book of discipline and a smaller structure. Now, these three plans were given to the Council of Bishops in April. And in May, the Council of Bishops came out with their decision to present the one church plan, that one in the middle, to the General Conference of the United Methodist Church in February of 2019. So in February, this is what will be presented, along with some history around the other two plans at the same time. Now, some of you are thinking, Dave, why are you telling us all this? We are never going to beat the Baptist to Cracker Barrel. How... Why is this? Why is this important? Well, here's what I here's what I want to say. Whatever decision is made by our general conference and by our church will affect Shiloh because we are connected together as a United Methodist Church and we celebrate together and we struggle together and we live together. One of the things I have learned in my four years here at Shiloh is that we are what I like to call a beautifully diverse congregation. And what that means to me is that you might be sitting with somebody who thinks very differently on you than you do on certain topics. And yet... We've learned to do church together. We've learned to love one another. We've learned to serve together. And we've learned to separate what's, what uh, is different from what unifies us. For 200 years, Shiloh Church has figured out a way to bring diverse people together. For them to listen and to love one another. For us to respect one another in our differences, whether they be political or theological or economic or whatever they are. That Shiloh has a 200-year history of welcoming its neighbors, bringing the community together, and saying, I love you because Jesus loves you, even if we don't always agree on every detail. So today, I am encouraging you, as this becomes uh, begins to come to a head in February 2019, some decisions will get made. It will be on the news. You will have neighbors who will have questions. You will run into somebody at Speedway who will go, hey, I just saw you come out of that Methodist church. What the heck is going on with you people, right? This will happen, and so I want A, I want you to be prepared. But B, I just want to remind you and encourage you 
to continue our policy of grace and love for all people who come and who connect with Shiloh, our policy of, of listening and, and respect as we offer ourselves in relationship to people who may be in a different place than we are, our policy of prayer for our church and for our denomination and for, for those who may be in a different place, and our policy that unity does not require uniformity. And so I just want to share this with you as a piece of information so that when you hear about this, you go, oh, yeah, we, we chatted a little bit about this. I also want you to know that if you have more questions or if you'd like more resources or you'd like to do a little reading or studying on this topic, I would love to share some of what I have read with you and what I have studied with you. And at any time, um, just know that we are the church, not because we're all exactly alike, but we are the church because we are called by Jesus Christ to be the people of God, the hands and feet in this community. And what unites us is greater than what divides us.